joining us online, man, I say welcome. Thank you so much for spending part of your week with us. It's so good to have all of you that are in the house with us here and now today. Before we get into the message this week, I just want to give a little bit of an update on our next step. I know many of you have been by the building and you've seen the sign up on the outside and all that's happening. And so I just want to get us all on the same page because it is happening fast. Yeah. I have more gray hair as a result. So here's where we are. February the 11th will be our last Sunday here in this building. Yeah. February the 18th, we're going to have an online service as our teams finish up getting the building ready and the space ready for all of those that we are believing are going to show up on February the 25th, which will be the grand opening of our next step as a church. It's good stuff. A couple things that I want to note. We'll be reinforcing these and talking about these, just trying to get everybody informed. Our service times are going to change, so we will still have the 9 o'clock. Our second service will be at 1030 rather than at 11. So it'll be 9 and 10.30. And the reason is, is one of the common things I hear is I didn't even know that person went to merge. Two people going to the same church for a year plus and never cross paths because as you know, our parking is not ideal here. You got to drive around the back of the building like it's a cult. You have to cross a creek. And so we have to fully empty the parking lot here before we can have enough room for the next service to come in. And so one of the things that this building affords us the opportunity to do is to have enough parking spots and enough lobby space so that we can be one church with two services. And so we'll have some overlap in the lobby, and we care about that because we care about community here, and as we're going to talk about throughout the message series, we care about real relationships. The E and Merge is enter into real relationships. Our groups will be stronger as a result. Our relationships will be stronger. You're going to, to see people here that you didn't even know attended this church. So... I want to make something clear just to help out our parking team that is so incredibly faithful. It is freezing cold out there. They show up like polar bears. So we're still going to ask you to park in specific places. Because our services are going to overlap, if you can imagine... uh, uh, 250 to 500 cars trying to leave at the same time that these other cars are coming in. What happens is spots get left empty and open and popcorn in. Imagine if everyone showed up to Walmart at the exact same time. The mess that that would make. And so we're still going to have structure and organization. Why? Because we're trying to create that welcoming environment so everyone that comes in can hear the truth of God's word because our mission is to lead people to new life in Christ. And Some of you are going to have, like, you're going to know how it works, but your first time to church is terrifying. It's, frankly, a very miserable experience. You pull into a parking lot, you're not sure where to go. So it can be very comforting to know where to park. And so this gives us the ability to move those service times closer so that we can have better community. Here's what also happens as a result of moving those service times closer together. It makes it so much more attainable for us to serve one and worship one. No longer will there be this really long gap between the two services that's kind of awkward and unsure. I put it to our team like this. We don't have a halftime. We play double headers. I stop sweating before we make it to the second service. And and, and there's just this lull that occurs. And so what will happen is if you attend the nine, the moment you come out, it's going to be time to serve. And if you're serving at the nine, the moment you're done serving, it's going to be time to attend. And so it gives us this opportunity for everyone to serve one and attend one. And why does that really matter? It matters because we love who you are, not what you do. And we're going to talk about that as part of this message series, but I want you to hear this abundantly clear. We love you for who you are, not what you do. 
And because we care about who you are, we never want you serving from a place of empty. And if you're not having the opportunity to gather in corporate worship, to, to celebrate God's faithfulness, to receive the word locked arm in arm with one another, what happens is you get yourself to a place of empty. And we care about who you are too much to watch that happen. So we're moving our service times to create better community, to give better opportunity to serve one and to worship one because we care about who you are are not what you do. So what do we need you to do? I know we just said we care about who you are, but we care about who you are enough we want to see you operating in your gifts. And we want to see you fulfilling God's purpose for your life. So the first thing that we need you to do is we need you to sign up for MOVE. If we have that number, I should have it memorized, but i got to be honest, I don't. <laughs> if you would text MOVE to this number, 4793, you can do it right now. Dead serious. Pull your phone out. It's perfectly acceptable. You don't have to wait. If you wait, you'll forget. I don't remember the number. I think I probably made the number, and I don't remember the number. So let's do it right now. Let's text MOVE to 479-348-45555. And here's what is going to happen. You're going to get information about when we have opportunities for you to come and help us get moved in. Just this last week, we had opportunities for people to show up and serve. And here's what's really cool. When everyone's pulling on the same rope, no one has to become exhausted. And so when there's a whole lot of people, in fact, last week, I think we just kind of did this, and it was snowy, and it was whatever, and 80-something people signed up, and we showed up, they moved chairs. By the time I got there, it was done. And it's incredible, because then people get to have community and have conversation, and everyone doesn't have to walk around beat down and exhausted when everyone's pulling on the same rope. So you, so you sign up for moving. And then the second thing that I'm going to ask you to do is to sign up to serve if you aren't yet serving. There's a blue card in the seat back in front of you. There's a QR code on it. Scan it. Sign up. And when you sign up, you begin to use your gifts and you begin to have these moments in your life where you see God working in and through you. And our vision at this church is to see kingdom come through your life. Not just through this church, but we want to see kingdom come in and through your individual life. That is our job as a staff, is to equip you to do the work of the ministry, to see kingdom come in and through your life. And we take it very seriously. So sign up to serve. And it's really important in our next step because we want to make sure that merge is still merge, right? How do we carry the DNA forward? By all of you that are here serving there. It's how we continue to do what we do because merge is merge and merge will always be merge, but merge is merge because of you and because of the culture that you carry. And so we need you using those gifts in the new space, carrying that culture forward because that's just a building. We're going to make it a home for people to come and find new life in Christ. And that happens when you guys, I want, and what you do, I was preparing the annual report for this year. And there's some really incredible things that happened in 2023. I can't wait for you to see it. But one of the incredible things is we have 398 people actively serving on teams right now. Yeah, you can clap for that. The prayer is that it's over 1,000. In 2024. Because again, we care about who you are, and when everyone is pulling on the rope and everyone is doing their part, no one has to get to a place of empty. So we serve one and we worship one, and everyone pulls on the rope and everyone participates, and it's how the kingdom of God moves forward on this earth through Christ's local church. And so as I say that, here's, here's what we're going to ask specifically when you're on a team. I'm going to ask you to sprint with us for six months. It's going to be crazy. I'm just telling you, we're going to move in. Five weeks later, we're going to have Easter weekend. Three weeks later, we're going to have a baptism Sunday. Four weeks after that, we're going to have Mother's Day. Come on. Amen? Yeah. That kind of feels like God's timing to me. This opportunity 
to take big swings at it right when we get into this new building. And so we're going to ask you to sprint with us to make sure that that DNA is carrying and that culture is carrying forward. And I know some of you are like, no way, I don't want to move stuff and and I don't want to serve and I don't want to do any of that. I'm not even sure if I want to be here. And maybe you came in the room and you don't yet know Jesus. Like you're just skeptical of this whole thing. Can I tell you that's perfectly fine? Like you can sit here as skeptical as you want to be for as long as it takes because I know if you just keep showing up, what happens is the Holy Spirit will begin to work on your life in a way that I never can. So this is a safe place for you to be skeptical. But here's what I would tell you. If you'll give us 10% of your trust for the next six months, we'll earn the other 90%. If you'll sprint with us and run with us, we'll love you as well as we can because we care about who you are, not what you do. And this is going to be an incredible year. We're going to look back on it and we're going to see that we got the opportunity to be a part of something really, really special in the kingdom of God. Amen. Come on, give God some praise. I try not to take up message time with announcements, but I felt like that was justified. So let's dive into the word and get in this message. Man, it's part three of our series, New Growing Fresh Faith, where we're talking about how we can grow. And we kicked it off talking about spiritual growth because we understand that spiritual growth is the foundation to all healthy growth in our lives. And today we're going to talk about growing in our relationships. And last week we talked about growing in our emotions and in our emotional maturity and our emotional response. Why? Because it's hard to have great relationships without great emotional response, without great emotional maturity. And in Mark chapter 12, verse 28, we see this passage that's occurring in Jesus' is teaching in the synagogue, and he's leading people in a way that only Jesus can. And it says this, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked Jesus, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now, if you pause here, oftentimes we portray this passage as though this particular teacher of the law is being a little bit snarky and he's trying to pigeonhole Jesus. And maybe that is true. Maybe this particular individual heard the debate and he heard the responses of Jesus and he thought, I'm going to trick him. But it also could be that this is just an educated individual, a Jewish rabbi, and he spent his life counting six 113 individual statutes in the law. Every day trying to measure up to all of the rules and the list. And so in having 613 individual statutes, what the teachers of the law would often do is try to debate and differentiate between what they called heavy commandments and light commandments. Like, which ones do we really have to follow, and which ones are going to be okay if I don't follow on Tuesday? Kind of like raising kids. Mom throws the middle name in there, that's a hup to moment, you know what I'm saying? If she asks you without even speaking your name, totally safe. First name, a little bit warm, middle name, you better do it. They're just trying to figure out. Like, which rules are most important and which ones should we prioritize? Because priorities shape the direction of our life. And this is what Jesus says. The most important one is this. And Jesus kicks it old school. He throws it back to this passage that we find in Deuteronomy. He's quoting scripture, Adam. He says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love. Everybody say love. Love Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment than these. I like the response. Well said, teacher. The man replied, you're right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. We see this concept of loving our neighbor echoed in John 13 and 34, where John says, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. John echoing the words of Jesus, 
Love one another as I've loved you. So you must love one another. And then in 1 John 4 and 19, it says, We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, your truth. God, I pray that it would speak clearly in and through me today. God, I pray that each and every one of us would be transformed by your power, by your might, that we would stand in awe of your faithfulness and in the way that you're moving in and through this house. We give you all the praise, honor, and everybody said a great big. I love Jesus' response. This is a super difficult question. It's a question that a man is asking about 613 different statutes in the law and which one should he prioritize. And Jesus breaks it down like this. Love God. Why? Because our love of God brings forth all other love in our life. True biblical love comes from from understanding and elevating the Father in our life and recognizing his goodness. Then Jesus says this, hey, after you love God, I want you to love your neighbor. Starts to get a little tricky there, right? Because God's perfect, and we can stand in awe and in recognition of that truth, and he says, yeah, but I want you to also love those that are around you that have some imperfections This is a relational concept that we're talking about here. This isn't a transaction that Jesus is illustrating. Jesus is illustrating transformative relationship and saying, I want you to love your neighbor. And then he gives a little bit of a third step. He says, I want you to love your neighbor. How? I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. And I personally believe that this is a stumbling block for many of us in our faith journey because many of us struggle to love ourselves in a biblical concept. See, some of you in the room, like, you really love yourself. You know what I'm saying? Like, you wake up every day, you look in the mirror, bed head, stanky breath, and you think inside your head, the world is lucky to have me. And part of me is proud of you for feeling that way. But there's a real fine line between loving yourself and pride. And if we value ourselves from a place of pride, we will never love our neighbor as Christ so loved us. And I know maybe you're going through a season where you're just trying to speak words of affirmation. And maybe you say, I'm just finding myself. But here's what's really crazy about the upside-down kingdom of God. We were meant to lose ourselves so that we could find God. Hence the prioritization of loving God, then your neighbor, how? As yourself. Some of you wake up and you feel that way and you're just fired up about it, but I believe that many of us wake up every day, we look in the mirror, and we list everything we hate about ourselves. I've gained weight. I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough friends. People don't really value me. My life is destructive. I'll never get past the decisions that brought me to this place of brokenness. All I can remember is the mistakes and the regret and the shame. When we look at ourselves, we look at ourselves from a place of disgust. And if that's you, can I just encourage you today that the creator himself sees you values you, loves you, and cares for you. And if you're to love your neighbor well, and your neighbor includes your spouse and your kids, not just the guy down the street, includes your coworkers and the one that you're just crossing paths with, that you may never learn their name. If you are to love your neighbor as God calls us to love and to have real relationship with them, you have to love yourself in a biblical, appropriate concept. So the goal is this, to wake up, to look in the mirror, and make the decision to see yourself as God sees you. God sees you as his creation. 
And when you begin to see yourself as God's creation, you will begin to love yourself in the right way, which gives you the ability to love your neighbor as you are called to do so. Why is this important for us as believers, for us as a church, for us as a community? It's important because we can't love others as God loves them if we don't love ourselves as God loves us. We lack the ability, hence why Jesus is laying it out. He says, you got to love God. And then you have to love your neighbor. Oh, and by the way, you have to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you're loving God, you'll love yourself in the appropriate way. He's creating a circle for us so that we can live in consistency of relationships, so that we can grow in our relationships through our new faith. I'll illustrate it to you like this. When I was practicing law full time, there, there was a period of my time when, when I, I did a lot of work in another state, and I had two uh, assistants at the time. One of them handled my criminal cases, and one of them handled my civil cases. And the assistant that handled my criminal cases, man, it was like, dude, she saw a mountain and was like, let's climb it. I mean, she was happy and excited and joy-filled and exuberant. If there was a problem, she was going to find a solution. In fact, one time, I'm in the middle uh, of a homicide trial, and there's a witness that I need. And this particular witness is about 12 hours from us and is being sort of difficult. That's a nice way of saying, like, you want to choke them, you know what I mean? And my assistant says, don't worry. Hops in the car, drives overnight, and shows up with this lady ready to testify the next morning. Now, I don't know about you, but I really like having people like that work with me. It's not a problem. It's an opportunity. Everything came from this place of positivity. Now, the assistant that handled my civil cases loved her, loved her, to be abundantly clear. But she's sort of like if a porcupine and a grizzly bear had a baby. You kind of walk in on Monday like this a little bit, you know, like peek your head in there like poop, you know. Not overly positive, really good at identifying problems. Very, very skilled at identifying problems. (laughs) Now the positive one spoke positively and the negative one spoke negatively. And what happens is this simple truth. What you share with yourself, you will share with others. One of them woke up every day and felt good about life and saw the opportunity and and, and valued herself and valued other people. One of them woke up every day and struggled just a little bit along the way and, and, and spoke some negative things about herself often. What you speak about yourself, you will speak to other people. What you share with yourself, you will share with other people. Jesus is illustrating this when he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And his intent was for you to love yourself appropriately. It's why he gave up his life for you and for me. And when we get this as a church and we love people well, what happens is we reach people well. There are a whole lot of people all around us that qualify as our neighbors that think to themselves, why would I want to be a part of the mess that is the local church? Here's what I know. We should be the most love-filled, hopeful, positive, joyous people the world has an opportunity to be around because we fully recognize the value of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in our life and we allow that simple truth to anchor every single decision that we make. And when he becomes our anchor, we love people well. But all of it starts with you getting you right and you loving yourself well by prioritizing God above all else Because every relationship in your life begins with you. Loving yourself not out of pride or selfish gain or ambition is one of the greatest witnesses to God's grace and the keys to growth that we have in the relationships of our life. So here's three thoughts. Maybe you came in and you've been struggling 
to love yourself well. Here's three really quick thoughts. God loves you and is cheering for you. We hear God loves us, but I think we forget that he's cheering for us. In fact, the writer in Hebrews draws this picture of you and I running a race, calling us to run it with endurance, and he paints this beautiful portrait of a crowd gathered in heaven as though they're cheering us on, supporting us, and loving us. And so maybe you don't hear that voice in your life every day, but can I just remind you, God doesn't just love you, he's cheering for you. He's pulling for you, he's rooting for you, he's encouraging you. Second thing is this, I want you to realize, you are forgiven. Yeah. So stop holding a grudge against yourself. And the third thing is this, God is calling you to a high standard of love and relationship because he loves you and he wants to see you fulfill your purpose. I remember being in junior high and Man, I had a coach that liked to yell a lot. He did a little coaching with his yelling. Life's different these days, you young people. <laughs> Soft out there, you know. I remember, I was, not a, I was not a kid that took well to being yelled at. It wasn't my specialty, you know. And I remember he, him setting me down one day, and him, he, he looks me directly in the eye, and he's like, listen, son, the, the, the day I stopped yelling at you is the day you got something to worry about. I was 14, but that didn't make a lot of sense. At 37, I do a lot of yelling at my kids, and now it makes perfect sense, you know? I wanted something different though, right? Like that, that, that wasn't the response that, that, that I wanted. But what I recognize now is that I had a coach that was calling me to a high standard. And the high standard didn't always make me feel good, but it was actually a representation of how much he valued me. When you enter into real relationship with the Holy Spirit, as we talked about last week, what happens is you get called to a high standard that doesn't always make you feel good, but is a representation of the value that the creator places on your life. We at this church, listen, man, we, we, we call people to a high standard of love and real relationship building, not because we have it figured out, but because we love you, and we want to see you fulfill your purpose. See, God calls us to a high standard because he cares about who more than what. And in real relationship, we have to learn to value people for who, not what. So let me say this to you again. As we started the day, we love who you are, not what you do in this house. Because it's the foundation of genuine and real relationship. And if you're going to love your neighbor as yourself, you're going to have to love your neighbor for who they are, not what they do. So let's give it some legs. I would say this, stop searching and start becoming. Stop searching and start becoming. Romans 12, 9 through 12. If you were to open it up in a physical Bible, you might see a heading that says something along the lines of love in action. It's Paul giving some really good instruction on how we actually love our neighbor as ourselves. Like, how do we do this? And here's what he says. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted. Everyone say Devoted. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, 
It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul gives us some keys. To, like how do, how do I? It's great to say I'm going to love my neighbor as myself, but how do I actually do it? Just a few thoughts. The first is this. Focus on being one-faced. Practice not saying anything about anyone that you wouldn't say to his or her face. Now, some of you heard, like, don't be two-faced. That's the common phrase. But here's what I found. It's easier to start something than it is to stop something. So if we'll focus on being one-faced, what happens is we're naturally replacing the act of being two-faced. So we focus on being one-faced. Paul wrote that. Pretty wild. Crazy thought. But if I'm really to love my neighbor as myself, I have to get myself to a point where I focus on being one-faced. Now, this brings us back to why it's so important that you love yourself as God loves you. You view yourself as his creation. Because many of us have a tendency to be two-faced because we don't want anyone to say it to our face. Because anytime anyone speaks anything that feels remotely critical, we take it very personal and we become offended because we see all of our own faults and flaws above everything else in our life. But if I love myself well, as God calls me to, I become much more open to receiving that which other people have to say and it creates opportunity for one-faced relationship in my life. Second thought is this, be someone who de-escalates, not instigates. And this kind of comes second because oftentimes those of us that are one-faced, we're also often instigators. I was just telling the truth. But Paul highlights this, that, that vengeance is the Lord, that it's his to avenge. So we can be someone that de-escalates, we don't have to be someone that instigates. It's important. If you want to have real relationships, you can't be an instigator. Any of you play fantasy football? Like, raise your hand. This is full participation. Yeah, six of you. Got a lot of liars in the room. (laughs) If you play fantasy football, you're probably on a fantasy football text chain. And if you are on a fantasy football text chain, I don't really have to give great explanation of this. But for those of you that don't, there's always an instigator on a fantasy football text chain. And oftentimes, I have found that the instigation goes a little bit too far for other people. Here's what I mean. If you're constantly instigating, you become a very unsafe person for others to be around. And it makes it difficult for people to have real relationship with you because they're terrified that you're going to poke or prod or rip apart. We all have those people Many of us just spent the holidays with that, you know, one. that You've just been terrified. I hope they don't just jab me. I'm not sure that I have it. So Paul says, be someone who de-escalates. And I think de-escalation can sometimes feel like weakness. But there's this part in Scripture where Jesus has been betrayed by this guy named Judas. And Judas is bringing the the, the Roman guards to arrest Jesus for crimes that he didn't commit. And so Peter, Peter's one of Jesus' like real homeboys, right? So Peter whips his sword out and he slashes the guy's ear off. And I read that part and I'm like, let's go Peter. You know what I mean? Like, I need that guy on my team. And Jesus is like, bro, put your sword up. But I've never read that and thought Jesus was weak. Because when you keep reading, what you find is that Jesus was getting ready to take on a cross. He de-escalated his situation, trusting in the purpose and the promise of God in his life. That that God was greater, that God was elevated, that what God had to say about him was more valuable than what anyone else could say. De-escalation is not weakness. Be someone who de-escalates, 
not instigates. Another thought, be at peace with others. Michael said it so well this morning, but peace is yours. It is a gift, and it's not some worn out, tattered, worldly peace. It is the peace that only Jesus Christ can give you. And he didn't just transfer this thought of peace. No, he's transferred his peace into you as his follower. So be at peace with others. And the fourth thought is this. Paul says to serve others. He says, do it because you're devoted in love, one to another. That's important we highlight that the love this scripture is talking about isn't quid pro quo. It isn't, I'll do something for you in exchange for something. It is being devoted one to another in a a one-way love. I'm going to love you if you never love me back. I'm going to serve you if you never serve me back. I'm going to be generous to you if you're never generous to me back. It doesn't matter. I don't have to receive something from you. I'm simply going to exchange it. Isn't this the love of Christ? gave it to us so that we can freely receive it. It's unconditional and does not expect repayment. And one of the reasons that we challenge you to serve in the church is because the church is the bride of Christ. It is the mechanism through which the good news of Jesus flows to the lost and dying ears and lives that are all around us. And when we serve in the church, it's not to expect repayment. We've already been paid through the gift of the bloodshed of Jesus Christ. But it's being devoted one to another in love. I want you to hear this. Serving the local church, it's not born out of obligation, but out of a recognition of Christ's love and sacrifice in my life. And I so desire for others to experience that same love that I serve them. And serving in the church becomes really valuable because the church is a rare place in which we serve people we don't yet know expecting nothing in return. I know my wife. I know my kids. I serve them, but I know them. I may serve people. You may serve people at your workplace, but... Something tells me you expect that paycheck in exchange. The church is the rare, if not the only place where we serve others we don't yet know, expecting nothing in return. Why? We are serving those we don't know so they can become known. Known by the Father who already longs to have real relationship with them, known by you and me in community where they can be supported and valued and acknowledged. We are serving those we don't know so that they can become known. Because a group of unknown individuals isn't the goal. A community of believers devoted to one another in love is. Notice what Paul said. Just two words in a sentence. Practice hospitality. Do we recognize hospitality as a biblical principle? All the weird, different, goofy stuff we do is scriptural. How we do it, eh, you know, we're just figuring that out. But what we do, do you recognize parking team? When you stand out in the cold and you park a car, you're being devoted to one another in love. And when you show up and you make piping hot coffee to serve to someone else, you're being devoted to one another in love, practicing hospitality. You realize that when you check a kid in and and you meet a family that's never been here before, you're being devoted one to another in love, practicing hospitality. When, when, When you rock that baby in that room, you're being devoted one to another in love, practicing hospitality, doing what Scripture calls us to do. This this whole thing's not accidental. It's not unintentional. It's being devoted one to another in love. And here's what happens. When you grow in love, you grow a heart to serve more. 
So what do we do? We love God. Meaning what? Elevate God above everything else in your life. That's what he really desires. Elevate God above everything else so that you can love your neighbor how as yourself and I don't know where you are in your journey but I do know this the foundation to your healthy relationships all begin with your relationship with God So we love God first, and then we love our neighbor as ourself because Christ so loved us. Heavenly Father, we value you. We elevate you above all else in our lives, declaring that you are more than enough. God, we praise you, and we glorify you, and we magnify you in this place. And God, I pray that we would be a church that genuinely loves others, that enters into real relationships, that walks alongside one another, not just in the victories, but in the moments that feel like defeat, knowing that it is temporary. Heads bowed, eyes closed all across this place. Maybe you came in this room and you would just, in a moment of vulnerability, you would say, you know what, Jacob, like I really struggle to love myself. And I think it's a stumbling block in my ability to love other people well. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up? Nobody's looking around. Not going to embarrass you. Thank you, guys. All over the place. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Heavenly Father, God, I pray. I pray for each individual that lifted their hand in this place. God, I pray that you would make your face shine upon them, that you would be gracious to them that you would give them a peace that comes from understanding that they are your son or your daughter, that you know them, that you've gone before them, that you're walking beside them, and that you'll come behind them to give them the push that they need to continue on this journey. God, I pray that they see that your love is for them and that you're cheering them on, that they are forgiven that you know each and every thought each and every moment each and every doubt anxiety and fear and that you are greater than all of it we give you all of the praise honor and thanksgiving and everybody in the house said a great big amen come on give jesus some praise